painted my switch. Did you notice that on this thing, the lapel? I got green on one side and red on the other. Green means, or yeah, green means go, right? If I could just remember what it means now, it would be good. Amen. Green means hit, hit the gas pedal, doesn't it? What? Yellow means hit the gas pedal. <laughs> You're about to lose your light. You better go. All right. I'm glad there's somebody besides me thinks that. Ephesians chapter 5 this evening. Ephesians chapter 5. I want to preach a message entitled, Love Even as Christ. Love Even as Christ. I don't know if I'm qualified to do that. I mean, preach it. It's a command. The Bible also tells us, Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ, or even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So we ought to forgive as God does. We ought to love as God does. Boy, that is a high standard, isn't it? But God is the standard. For all things that are good and right, God is our standard. There is none other. Stand with me if you have your place. Ephesians chapter number 5. I don't have my place. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 21. We're going to start in 21 go to the end of the chapter. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, this is our text verse, and listen to this. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Let's pray. Father, help me tonight to, in the proper way, in the proper heart, in the proper speech, convey what this passage is telling us as men. God, I believe if there's something we fail at, it's that balance between being firm and being affectionate, knowing what love is and how to express it. Lord, I believe in our society today, most of us misunderstand love. We don't even know what it truly means. But God, to understand it, all we have to do is look at the cross. Lord, help us to love like that. Help us to learn how to love as Christ loved his church. We ask for your help and your guidance in this message. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This passage has a lot that we could look at, but we know what it is talking about is an allegory for God or for Christ and his church. The love that they have is symbolized by the love between a husband and a wife. And what was interesting as I looked at this is the part about uh, leaving. The Bible says he shall leave his father and mother and join to his wife. They too shall be one flesh. Well, if the Lord is speaking about this in a, in a comparison between marriage and the church relationship, then when we join a church, we also ought to leave 
that uh, world behind. Amen. The Bible says, Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. So when we do not do what God is instructing us to do, we do not leave the world, but we dabble in it, we uh, revel in it, then we are committing spiritual adultery. We are cheating on Christ. We don't like that, do we? We don't like the sound of that. That sounds serious, that sounds bad, but it is what we do. And so the Lord says that the relationship between a man and a woman is a reflection of the relationship between Jesus Christ and His church. Jesus loves the church with a perfect love. Now we as human beings are always going to come short of that, but we ought to strive for that. Amen. Just because we cannot and we know we cannot achieve a perfect love does not mean we ought not to strive for it. It ought to be our goal in life to be Christ-like. Is anybody ever going to reach that place in their life that they are just like Christ? Anybody? And yet, should we not? Do you agree that we as Christians ought to strive to be more like Jesus Christ? Amen? Everybody that agrees, say amen. amen. And so we know we're not going to reach that goal. It's a lofty goal. It's an impossible goal. But it is a goal that God has told us to strive for. He said, be ye holy as I am holy. Are we? Is anyone here going to reach that place? Are you ever going to be as holy as God? No, never. But God said, strive that direction. Work towards that goal. Amen? I'm thankful that God understands our frame and knows us and forgives us for being who we are. But what I want to focus on tonight in this passage is a husband's love for his wife. In our text verse, in verse number 23, he very plainly says, um, no, in verse 25, he says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. It's been often said, and it's absolutely true, that God admonishes men to love over and over again in the Bible because men are not made naturally love. That in us, our, our motivation or drive is to survive, to be strong, to be firm. And we feel like emotion is one of those things that prohibits us from surviving or going forward or achieving what we want. And, <coughs> excuse me, and so uh, many times young men are trained or taught, maybe inadvertently, that, you, that real men don't cry. Real men don't have those mushy feelings of love and, and things of that nature. Real men don't need anything. We are independent. We can do. And that's not the truth. The Bible said when he made Adam, he wasn't finished because he said that needs something more. And he made a woman. Amen. Men, we are not complete by ourselves. We are not what we ought to be by ourselves. We need the woman that God has put into our lives. And so the Lord adds instruction to the Bible to give us a vision, to give us a, a, an idea of how we should treat our wives. He says that we should treat them and love them even as Christ and I don't think he left it like that. I believe if we read this, we're going to do that tonight. We're going to look through this and we're going to dissect this passage and we're going to see how Christ loves. How Christ loves the church. And he said, you love your wife the way I love the church. Okay? So that's what we're going to do tonight. Number one, deny yourself. Look with me in verse number um, 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it. True love will require denial of self. Years ago, I was going to try to find this. It's so hard for me to go back and find things I, I once read online. But there was this uh, little uh, illustration about a young man that was about to get married, and he went to his dad concerned, and he said, I'm just worried that she's not the one for me, that, that maybe marriage is not for me. He said, you're right, marriage is not for you. 
Marriage is for her. You marrying her, your life, your existence with her is for her benefit. Her marriage to you, her existence is for your benefit. It's reciprocal. You ought to be loving one another as Christ loved the church and that includes denying self. There is no place for selfishness in marriage. Look with me in Matthew 16. This is a Christian character trait, not just a husband ad admonition. Matthew chapter number 16 has a very important passage here. Verse 24, he says this, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, so if that is your desire to follow Jesus Christ, listen, if it's not, quit now, amen? If you have no desire to honor the Lord with your life and you're just playing games, you'll be better off in the world. Amen, I'm serious. Quit yanking God's chain. Quit trying to behave and, and pretend to be something you're not. But if you truly have in your heart a desire to be like Christ and follow after him, look what he tells you to do. Let him deny himself. And take up his cross and follow me. Your cross is your burden. The things that you struggle with in your flesh, that's your cross. This flesh is your cross. He said, let him take up his cross. Let him deny himself. Our theme this year is yield. And I've, I did not impress that on the church as much as I wanted to throughout the year. But listen, if we don't get that accomplished in our Christian life, everything else is going to fail. Because what we want to do is live the Christian life in a selfish manner. And the problem with that is those two things are contrary one to another. The love of Jesus Christ was completely selfless. He went to the garden and he prayed, Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He didn't want to have to go to the cross. He didn't want to have to have the sin, the weight of the sin of the world upon him. Girls, listen. He did not want to have to have that. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He said, I'm willing, my love for the world, my love for mankind is such that I'm willing to yield what I want for what you need and what you want, Lord. And that's what he did. He went to the cross for us. He loved the church and he died for the church. There is no place in marriage for selfishness. When a, a couple gets married, when I married my wife, we too became one. All of our troubles, all of our problems, everything we had became the same. I've mentioned this to the church recently that I had some debt I brought into our relationship, into our marriage. And I didn't really mean to. I was young and foolish, and I had that. It wasn't a huge amount of debt, but still, after we had been married a year or so, we got a letter that where Wendy had worked before. She had a program where they were putting money aside for her in, a, in an account. They said, you can roll that over into some sort of an investment, or you can cash it out. And so we talked about what to do, and I, she said, well, let's cash it out and pay off this debt. I said, well, honey, the thing is, that's my problem. I did that. And she said, no, it's ours. What a blessing. Because a lot of times we want to be married but still keep things separate, and that's not godly. That's not biblical. Every problem I have now was hers. Every problem she had now was mine. There is no place for selfishness in marriage. We can't say, well, look, you know, I married you, but I didn't marry your family. Yes, you did. I've been told that many a time. When you married her, you married her family. Amen. Amen. Some of you men are like, I don't know why I didn't run away. <laughs> we married, maybe I should say some of you women are like, I don't know why I didn't run away. But we married everything about them. We married their life. Our two lives became integrated together. Men, deny yourself. Give yourself up for your wife. Amen. There are men with hobbies. They will not let that hobby go. They're hanging on to it. They'd rather go bankrupt than let their hobby go. And they're dragging their marriage through that, that mess. Let it go. Let it go. 
let go of all of the ambitions of having all the riches right away and everything you want. We live in a, an age where uh, couples want to get married and immediately have everything grandpa has. Whatever happened to starting at the bottom? My mom and dad taught me that. Listen, we got married, we rented a little old one-bedroom apartment, and I still couldn't make ends meet. I couldn't hardly pay for that. So we downgraded to a studio apartment. Everything's in one room. Kitchen's on that side of the room. The bed's over there. There's a sofa here. That was tight. And roaches in the kitchen. And if they're in the kitchen, they're in everything. Amen. I remember one night, we were in an apartment building. The people upstairs moved out, and their roaches moved south. And so I remember uh, the next morning, we get up, and they're all over the place. They weren't there the day before. They're all in there, our house. And I said, honey, I got to go to work. She says, I can't be here by myself. I said, honey, you got to. I got to go to work. So I left and went to work. I called the apartment manager from work. He said, oh, we'll get an you know, a insect guy. We'll get an exterminator out there in a, in a few days. I said, no, sir. Said, You'll get out there today. Said, We're not going to stay there if you don't get out there and take care of it. Boy, you say, well, why, why didn't you do better? Because we wanted to start where we ought to start. Amen. We didn't want to get ourselves in over our head. Deny yourself. Don't think you have to have everything and hold on to everything. Don't try to be somebody else. Don't try to keep up with the Joneses. Let me say this. Cut the apron, apron strings. Cut the apron strings. Look at Mark chapter 10 with me. Mark chapter 10. As you're turning, I'll tell you a story of a, uh, a fellow, a couple, that had a daughter, and she got married. And uh, one night, of course, the phone rings, and they haven't been married long, and the dad picks up the phone, talks to her a little bit, and hangs up. Mom said, what was going on? So, well, her and her husband had an argument. What did she say? He said she wanted to come home. She said, what did you tell her? I said she was home. Amen! Amen. Buckle your seatbelt. That's just the beginning. I mean, everybody tried to warn you. Everybody said before you walked that aisle and said, I do, it's tougher than you think. But you wouldn't listen. Mark chapter 10, verses 6 through 9. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Man, I could preach on that for a while right now, amen. Male and female, there's two, that's it. Amen. Review that, Facebook. There are two genders, male and female. That's it. That's not hate speech, that's fact. And we've got a bunch of idiots running around out there trying to make some sort of a ruckus out of something that shouldn't even be mentioned. They ought to be laughed out of town. They're making a mockery of our country and our society. Amen. Amen. Man, I want to go on so bad. Boys ought to play with trucks and girls ought to play with dolls. Amen. Don't put a dress on your little boy. Whew. Man, why did I go there? Mark 10, verse 7, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain, but one flesh. You are not an individual, now you are one. Amen. He said, well, if I don't like it, we could just move out. You may as well take a sword and cut yourself right in half because that scar and that wound will be in your life for the rest of your life. If you don't believe me, go ask some of them who've experienced it. You hang in there. You work through it because that's what the Bible says to do. You love her. You deny yourself and you keep going. Amen. Say, so how do I love even as Christ? You deny yourself. Everything you think is your right, throw it out the window and take a look at what your responsibility is. We live in a day where men are abusing their wives and it makes me sick. Well, let me change that. We're not living in a day. It's been that way. 
Men want to go around being rough and tough and act, treat their wife like their buddy at a shooting range. Listen, you better start treating your wife the way she ought to be treated. Don't ever let me see you abusing and misusing your wife. Amen. There'll be some problems. I might go to jail, but it'll be well worth the, the, the time. By the way, ladies, let me tell you this. And I've told ladies this. They've called and I've gone over to, to talk with them. They're weeping and crying. I don't know what to do. I, I'm scared. And I said, if you're scared, call 911. Really? The pastor would say that? Absolutely. Get it on record. If your husband has hit you, if he's been violent towards you, you stop and call 911 and then call your pastor and I'll be right behind you. Nothing but a coward would raise his hand against his wife. It's worthless. You know what they used to do to a man like that or a wimp like that? They'd ride him out of town on a rail. Amen. For those of you who don't understand, that would hurt a guy. Amen. They'd take an old fence rail and they'd put him in the middle, straddling like a horse, put that on their shoulder, and they'd run as rough as they can right out of town with him and then throw him off in the woods. They'd tar and feather him. Not trying to kill him, but they want him to understand you're not going to get away with that in this town. Amen. I'm sick and tired of looking at, on TV at violence about this and violence about that and this person did this, this person did that. Call 911. Get it on record. Deal with it. Because it's not right. It's wrong. Men, deny yourself. Number two. Going back to our text in Ephesians chapter 5. The Bible says Jesus gave himself for the church. Everything he did, he did for the purpose of benefiting the church, not himself. Before you make a decision about a purchase, before you make a decision about a trip, you better question your motives and ask, how is this going to impact my marriage? Amen. You better figure it out. Number two. Be spiritually responsible for her. Look at verses 26 and 27. That he might sanctify and cleanse it. Speaking of the church. So how he's treating the church is how we ought to treat our wives and love them. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. This is a spiritual process of cleaning us spiritually through the word of God. It is the man's responsibility. Listen, we are a reflection of Jesus Christ. It was Jesus' responsibility and is today to wash his church and cleanse his church with the washing of the water by the word. And so it is the man's responsibility in the home to make sure that we are washing and cleansing our home with the water of the word of God. True or not? Say amen if you agree. And if not, if I'm wrong, show me. He says here in this, this passage, he says, uh, wash it with the water of the word that he might present it. Present it to himself, a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. This idea of a presentation, I, I wasn't in the military, but I have been to some presentations, some things there where they uh, re do reviews and things like that. My brother one time was getting ready one morning. He said he had a presentation. I don't know exactly what they call it, what the official term was, but they were going to consider him for rank, for moving him up in rank. And so he had to have his uniform just right. And I remember him being so nervous about everything. Irish pendant. An Irish pendant is a piece of string that's hanging off of the uniform. They were not allowed. You couldn't have an Irish pendant. An Irish pendant was ugly. I think that's probably racist too. Amen. It's against the Irish. But it was, it, it was something that they pr took pride in. They wanted to present themselves correctly. They wanted to look the best they could. Everything was shined to, to a T. Every, every uh, metal had to be perfectly straight. Their shoes had to be polished until you could see yourself in them. And they would stand there at attention and have the perfect form. Everything was practiced over and over and over again so that they would get a good review. 
Men, we ought to be in our home doing everything we can as if we are about to give an account for how we do it because we are. I believe every man will stand before God and give an account for his home and what happened there. <clears throat> you say, well, what about the woman? No, she won't. She'll give an account for her behavior, for the things she did, but she will not give an account for that home because the Bible says that's the man's position. I believe the qualifications we see in Timothy, it talks about the husband of one wife, and we often get stuck on that one and talk about the fact that you can't have two living wives and divorce and remarriage and not being able to pastor or be a deacon in those, those conditions. But we forget about all the other ones. The Bible talks about being blameless, ruling his own house well. Pastors that they've lost their families, their children are out in rebelliousness, and I'm talking about that's living in the home. Their kids are out of control. They've got teenagers. They can't even get to come to church. At that point, you need to resign and get out. Amen. We are spiritually responsible for our homes. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 11. <clears throat> I'm not telling you anything that's not Scripture. And listen, I'm fine. If you want to challenge me on any of this, I'll sit and listen to you, but you better take Bible and use it. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse number 3 says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, before you say, well, I, I just think it's, a, it's a, a, what's the word, chauvinistic to say that the man is the head of the home or the head of the wife. Well, also he says that God is the head of Christ. Is there something wrong with that? The Bible says that Jesus thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And yet the Bible says the head of Christ is God. Maybe our understanding of these things is all twisted by the worldly philosophies that we couldn't have a spiritual thought if we tried. It doesn't make the woman less of a person. It doesn't make them a slave or some a foot mat to wipe your feet on. That's not what that's about. What it's about is the man has been given a great responsibility that he will give an account to God for. And ladies, trust me, you don't want that responsibility. God has a spiritual order, and it's been that way from the beginning. Who did he create first, Adam or Eve? Adam. Was Adam made for Eve? No. Eve was made for Adam. Who did God instruct about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that he shouldn't eat of it? Who did God tell that to? Adam. Well, who told Eve? That's a question. Adam. I'm sorry I didn't hear. Maybe I missed it. Adam told him, told her. Adam was responsible for passing that instruction on to Eve. And we see that again and again throughout the Bible. Think about Abraham. God came to Abraham and said, Abraham, leave your kindred, leave your home, and go to a place I'll show you. Can you imagine that discussion in the Abraham household? Honey, we're moving. Well, what are we going to do about my sister? What about my family? Where are we going? God said he would show us. That's why Hebrews 11, the roll call of faith, mentions her. And says that she honored her husband. Because he said, God has led us to go. And she said, okay. I'm not sure if she said, okay, or if she cried for a while first and, and complained and tried to argue out of it and finally said, all right, fine. Amen? Maybe a year later she looked over at Abraham and said, honey, you were right. I'm sorry I cried about that. I'm sorry I gave you a hard time about that. I don't know. It could be. We don't have every minute of Abraham and Sarah's life printed out for us. But I know what human nature is. 
Human nature is not likely to just accept everything. How about this? God told Abraham, I'm going to have a sign between your people and me. It's going to be called circumcision. Can you imagine him explaining that to his wife? Moses' wife had a problem with it. Practice had been lost while they were in Egypt. When God brought them out of Egypt, God told Moses, he said, the first thing you're going to do is circumcise your family, your, ch- your boys, and your tribe. And his wife didn't like that much. You remember the argument they had? She said, you're a bloody husband unto me. She didn't like it much. But God gave the instruction to whom? The man or the woman? The man. And God has given the responsibility and the accountability of the home to the man. That's the man's position. It doesn't mean that the man is, is the more intelligent one. An intelligent man will get input from a lot of places, including his wife. But that's the one God has said to give it to. You say, well, I understand all that, but what if she won't yield to that? Read Hosea. In fact, God used Hosea, a prophet, to exemplify the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel had committed adultery against God. And they were sure that God didn't care about them anymore. And God used Hosea's life and his relationship to show that I do care for you and I do love you. What happened in Hosea's life, God told Hosea, he said, you go out and marry a prostitute. I want you to marry a harlot. Now, I don't know of any men that wants to marry a harlot. No, we, we like chase good women. That's what we want to marry. I wanted him, the first and foremost in my life, I wanted a wife that was pure and right. And so Hosea said, okay, Lord, if that's what you want. And he went out and married her and had children with her. Had three children. And it didn't go well. She left him. She ran off and began to play the whoredom, as the Bible calls it. Began to go out and be with other men. The Bible says in Hosea that they abused her, they mistreated her, captured her, made her basically a sex slave and then sold her on the market. And God told Hosea, he said, go buy her back. And so Hosea went and he bought his wife and took her home and cared for her and loved her. It doesn't matter. You still love them. That's what the Word of God says. You deny yourself, you be spiritually responsible. Number three, nourish her. Give her what she needs to grow. Going back to our text. In Ephesians chapter number 5, verses 28 and 29, how should we love our wives? We ought to pour our hearts and our souls into our wives. The Bible says, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. By the way, I told you at the beginning of this, this is hard for me to preach, because my wife's sitting right there. And our wives know us men. Your wife knows you better than anybody else. You might have this whole building full of people absolutely hornswoggle, but not your wife. And we feel like hypocrites when we try to straighten things out in our home because the devil will come whisper in your ear and say, nobody believes you. They don't care. The Bible says, nourish her. Look at verse 28. So ought men love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. I I can't believe men today. You know, I've never had an addiction to working out. Look at me. Amen. You can tell I'm telling the truth. I went and joined a gym. Amen. I went with Brother Glenn. Shortly after Pastor Zeller passed away, he said, I need to go to a gym. So I said, tell you what, let's join together. So we did. Man, I hated that treadmill. The only thing that made that even a little bit possible was that the news channel was up there and I was able to watch that or HGTV or something like that to get my mind off of what I was doing. You're running or walking in place. You're not going anywhere. But there's a lot of folk, they love working out. That is something they do on a daily basis. They, they do it religiously. They do it every day, every day. Why? Because they know it's going to benefit their body. 
But when a person makes that decision, I'm going to join a gym, I'm going to get healthy, they go for the first day and they work out for their 20, 30 minutes, whatever it is in their program that they're starting. Do they run home and look in the mirror to see what it did? No. They're going to be very disappointed. It takes consistency. It takes you being persistent at it. You will not notice within two days, three days, four days a week probably, but after a few months, you're going to go and say, hey, this is making a difference. What is it that makes a difference? Consistency. Small things done consistently, consistently make the biggest change. Nourish your wife. Love her. Give her what she needs to grow. Look at 1 Timothy 5.8 with me. By the way, I'm getting all over the liberals tonight. I mean, this is just Bible. I'm telling you, it's just the Bible. You either believe the Bible or you don't. If you don't believe the Bible, you're lost. I, can, I don't know what else to tell you. But the Bible says in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. He's worse than an unbeliever. That's what the Bible says. The model, the traditional model in our country that the liberals are so hard fighting against, that the man is the bread earner, the, the, the money earner in the home, and the wife is the one who stays and takes care of the home and the children and all of that, that the liberals hate it so much. You know why they hate it so much? Because it's God's plan. And they hate everything that has to do with God. God's plan was for the man to be the money earner, the one that goes out and works, the physical laborer in the family. Now, don't get me wrong, go to Proverbs 31 and you'll see that that, uh, that uh, virtuous woman was somewhat of an entrepreneur herself. She knew how to work, she knew how to do things and make some money and to do some stuff, amen? Amen. We've got some in our church that, that do some labor, do some work, and earn some money for the family. I thank God that my wife has a job working over at the library. I'm thankful for that. That's not what I'm saying. But her primary place is my wife. And when that job would interfere with what it is in my home, that needs to end. And it has, by the way. It's happened before, correct? We've said, you know what? This isn't very good for our marriage. And it had to end. But nourish her. Give her what she needs. Do what you need to do to take care of her. And a man who will not work and is too lazy to go and earn money is an absolute loser. Amen. You say, oh, that's really strong. Well, just nod your head. You don't have to say anything out loud because you know it's true. And our society is full of losers today. Those of you who work in, a, in a, a factory or warehouse or wherever you may work, you know how hard it is to get people to work. They come in to do a job. You can't find them with a search warrant in a few days. They're gone. They won't show back up. Amen, Brother Mike? People don't like to work. Our young people especially, do, they do not want to work. And our government, I, I'm way off track, man. Our government makes it easy. Let me put it that way. Just You finish that yourself because you know it's true. Yeah, mom and dad do too. Yep, they, they help enable that. But the model of a working husband and stay-at-home wife is God's model, not man's. That is a perfect situation in a marriage. Okay? That should be the norm in a marriage. That's what the Bible says. Number two, not only should the man provide for his own, according to what the Bible says in 1 Timothy 5, 8, but the man should protect his wife. And certainly not abuser. Go with me to 1 Peter 3, 7. 1 Peter 3, verse number 7. Back before our vacation, I began preparing this message. We preached a series last year, I believe it was, or maybe it was 2016, on raising children. Remember that series? And I said, We've got, I've got to preach a series on families. We're, we're in trouble as a nation. Look what he says here. 1 Timothy 5.8. Now 
Now, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong place. Hang on just a minute. We're in my 1 Peter 3, 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, your wife, according to knowledge. Listen. Wives aren't stupid. Don't treat them like children. Okay? They're grown-ups. They're just like you. They're adults. And I'll, I, I'll probably venture to say that in most cases our wives are smarter than we are. You ever see the thing, why, men, why women live longer than men? Man's got like a ladder, a 10-foot ladder on a couple of buckets and a, you know, a couple of traffic cones and he's precariously perched over a 20-foot drop. Or he's in a 51-foot lift cutting limbs out of a tree and dropping them on top of his roof of his house. I patched it. It's okay now. But he says, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife. Look at that. Giving honor unto the wife. I had a preacher ask me this. I'm serious. Honest to God. I'm not lying to you. I'm not making this up to make, embellish this message. A preacher asked me one time, he said, do you think it's biblical for a man to spank his wife? He said, do you think it's okay, according to the Bible, for a man to discipline his wife, to take a switch or his belt and whip his wife? I said, no! Are you out of your mind? If I try that shit, take it from me and whip me with it. But all joking aside, no, it's not okay. He said, dwell with them according to knowledge. You're both grown up, say, man, grow up. Giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Oh, there we go again. The Bible's offending women. No. It is a scientific proven fact that the female is the weaker vessel. Amen. She should be treated with honor, dignity. Amen. We ought to be chivalrous toward her. I don't, it never really happened to me, but I don't know if anybody's ever opened a door for a lady. I can get my own door. I'd be likely to slam it and say, okay. I don't know. I'm just saying. It's like that, that show years ago. I, I forget what it was. But uh, the woman said, I'm a woman. And he said, I know. I heard you roar. But he says as the, unto the wife as the weaker vessel as being heirs together of the grace of life. What a beautiful phrase. The grace of life. You know what marriage is? Think about this for a minute. Marriage is the grace of life. It ought to be a beautiful thing. It ought to be a sanctuary. Your home ought to be a place of peace and joy. Then what he says here is very troublesome. That your prayers be not hindered. If your prayers are hindered, then so will be your spiritual life. You're going to, you know the little kids song? We love doing this with our kids in chapel. Read your Bible, pray every, come on everybody now. Pray every day, pray every day. Read your Bible. Some of you are just not childish enough. Grow, grow, grow. And you'll grow, grow, grow. And you'll grow, grow, grow. But neglect your Bible. Forget to pray. And you'll shrink, shrink, shrink. And while that's a cute kid's song, it's absolutely true. If we neglect that life, that, that holiness that God wants us to live, we are going to go backwards. We're going to backslide. It is impossible to do otherwise. I'm not just trying to pick on people. I'm telling you, it's impossible to walk spiritually when we're not right with God. It's impossible. The Bible says nourish her. Protect her. Then I want to, I could go on with that. Protect her. Do not abuse her. Listen, don't abuse her physically and don't abuse her verbally. Don't abuse her emotionally. Do not abuse her any other way. She is a precious gift to you. You better honor her. Provide her physical needs. I'm going to try to be careful here, but go to 1 Corinthians with me in verse 7. The physical part of marriage is 
very important to talk about, but I'm not going to get into the bedroom part, but let me just put it this way. Husbands, you ought to show public affection to your wives. When's the last time you walked down a street holding your wife's hand? I'm amazed anymore. Most, most people, we'll see tonight, everybody be walking out with their hands held. But it's, it's amazing now to see that, and even in our, our existence, in our marriage, you know, I've seen it many times. I'll be like seven or eight steps ahead of her. I'm just focused. I'm going to the car now. You know? We forget. We don't, we're not thinking. You know, and I, I get convicted when a preacher says, you ought to open, Brother um, Danford was talking about opening the door for, for uh, the wife. I wish he would just stop meddling and preach. Just go on, do something else, amen. But we ought to. We ought to love our wives. We ought to show them due respect and honor. We ought to show affection to them. We have often kissed in church, and people, when they see me and Wendy kiss in church, they're like, oh, you should kiss in church? Well, that's the first place we ever kissed. I don't see a problem with it, amen. Now, I'm not going to get obscene about it, amen. There, there's a kiss, and then there's a go-to-the-bedroom kiss, amen. Get out of here. Get a room, amen. Some of you are all like, oh, I can't believe you said that. <laughs> You'll go home tonight and turn on your TV and see things ten times worse. Amen. Hey, we're family, aren't we? Amen. Sometimes there's some people in public, you're like, just get a room. You know, this is disgusting. But there ought to be affection shown, amen. I, I like to sit in church and see Brother Rick's arm around his wife. Isn't that a blessing, amen? Isn't that a blessing? Amen. Israel's glad his arm's around Corinne tonight. Praise the Lord, amen. Good job, well done. Amen, Brother Mike. <laughs> Both Brother Mikes, amen. Now everybody's going to be like... <laughs> uh, just quietly, just... All right, let's not get weird, Miss Wiggins. Amen. But they ought to provide for her physical needs. Listen, women have physical needs too. They need that affection. They need that show of affection. They need to know they're loved. You know, women, I, I don't know if you've noticed this, men, but women are very self-conscious about their appearance. Amen? Men are scared to death. They're like... But it's true. They want to know that they're pretty. Tell them. Say, man, you sure are cute. I like your hair that way. And I like that dress. That was really pretty. You know, I like the way you said that. You know, I like the way your, your face looks when you're thinking real hard. I like to see you cooking in there. No, that's just going too far out there. But I'm just joking. But anyway, hold hands. You know, cuddle with her. Sit down at home and cuddle with your wife. Let her know that you love her. Let her show her affection. You say, well, she knows I love her. Maybe she don't. Maybe the devil's starting to cause her to question that. Love your wife. Show her. 1 Corinthians 7, 3 through 5 tells us that. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife, listen, this is so important. The wife hath not power of her own body. You're not your own boss. You said, I do. You gave yourself to that man. Men, when you said, I do, you gave yourself to that woman. You are not your own boss. You don't say, well, nobody will tell me. You are one. Wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. Likewise, also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud. That's a, that's a very graphic word. That's a strong word. Defraud ye not one another except it be with consent for a time that you may give ourselves yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Show some love to your wife in front of others. She likes that. She likes for other people to see that you love her. She'll never say it. She's not going to... Listen, it takes something away if they have to say, all right, now you hold my hand. Hold my hand, quick, quick. So-and-so's looking. Hold my hand. Put your arm around me. That'd be nice. Put your arm around me. I like that. That takes something away from it, doesn't it? That's not the same. They want you to do it spontaneously. <clears throat> Let me say this, wife. It's not natural for him. Because he doesn't understand that. That's why the Bible says to honor them according to knowledge. 
Understand your wife. Understand how a lady is, how she thinks, how her mind is, how her personality is. She needs that affection. She needs to be shown love. Then I want to see lastly, in our back in our text, Ephesians 4. Verse number 39. I'm sorry, Ephesians 5, 39. There's not a 39 either. Why do I have verse 39 written here? Maybe it's because that previous point I was getting all flustered. I'm like, man, I've got to preach that. But make her important. The Bible says uh, here in this passage, verse 33, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, the wife see that she reverence her husband. Throughout this whole thing, Jesus is saying, cherish her. Cherish your wife. That word is to treasure her. It's something important. Proverbs 31 talks about the virtuous woman. It says, who can find a virtuous woman? Her price is far above rubies. You say, oh, mine's far from a virtuous woman. You better be careful, men. You better be extremely careful. You know, God's a lot more patient than I am. If I was in charge, he'd say, hey, you're in charge of making sure. I'd be, I'd be dropping people like that, man. God's so patient with us, men. Cherish her. He said, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. She's more important than money. Think about that a minute. You've got some households where both the husband and wife are working two jobs so that they can afford a five-bedroom home, a three-car garage, all those high-dollar cars in each one of the bays, and two or three storage units full of trash. Something's wrong there. You don't cherish each other, you cherish your stuff. That's why I say it would be good for America if we lost everything overnight. I think that would be a blessing. That got quiet, but it's true. We'd realize what's important then. Listen, your money's not going to hold you at night and weep with you when you're sad. Your car's not going to laugh with you when, when you're happy, when things are going well. Your house isn't going to raise a child with you. She's a treasure. Go with me to Proverbs 31. I think this is important to look at. <clears throat> Proverbs 31 is often thought about as the virtuous woman chapter. There's also a few verses in there about the man. Look at verse 28. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. And man, I'm going to put you on the spot right now, and this is going to hurt. When was the last time you praised your wife? When was the last time you told her how much you appreciate her and what a blessing she was to you? It's no wonder we're in trouble. It's no wonder that our society has a divorce rate that can't even hardly be measured anymore. It's because we're in love with ourselves instead of each other. He praiseth her. He voices his appreciation for his wife. Well, preacher, I would if I had a virtuous woman. You'd probably have a virtuous woman more if you'd praise her. If you would encourage her, you would strengthen her, you would help her forward. Look at Colossians 3 and verse 19. <clears throat> Colossians 3, verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Now, why on earth would God put a phrase like that in the Bible? Because he knows the tendency of men. When you don't understand why she's crying, it frustrates you. When you don't understand why she's so quiet, 
you immediately imagine that you've done something, she's mad at you, and you begin to let the devil whisper in your ear, and you begin to get all, well, I'm just going to go work in the garage, or I'm just going to go to the gym, or I'm just going to eventually go to the bar. And then there's a big, big problem. I'm going to go hang out with my buddies. The Bible says, be not bitter against them. You know what you need to make a practice of when that happens, when you feel like there's a problem there, you can't put your finger on it? Listen, honestly, ladies, we're not joking. We have no idea what's going on. We're clueless. We're not making that up. We don't understand. You know, sometimes us big knuckle-headed men, you just need to be flat out straight with us and say, you know what, I'm upset because you said so and so. And then, men, we need to be big enough to say, I didn't realize I did that. I am so sorry. Men, let's do something. Let's exercise some, okay? Everybody, all the men that are married, well, single men, you may as well get practicing, amen? Say it together with me on three. One, two, three. I'm sorry. That's hard, isn't it? Some of you men are like, bleh, bleh, bleh. <clears throat> all right, let's try again. It's easy. It's just the words come flowing out eventually. One, two, three. I'm sorry. And mean it. Amen? Now we're going to put some expression in it. Okay? I'm sorry. Like that, all right? One, two, three. I'm sorry. Amen? We need it. We need to mean it. We need to be honest about it. The Bible says, be not bitter against them. Why did he say that? Because he knows the man's tendency is to become bitter. Because men are, are frustrated, they can't figure out a woman. We can figure out a carburetor. We can figure out a computer circuit board. We can figure out about anything on earth, and we're proud of that. But we can't figure out the woman. You think maybe God designed it like that? Because every night when you go home, you're going home to a wonderful mystery. You're going home to learn something else about her. Maybe. The Bible tells us very plainly, husbands love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Whether or not you do that is totally up to you. I've given you what scripture says, and if you want success, you'll follow it. But if you don't, then you'll probably be picking up the pieces. Father in heaven, we love you. God, I'm grateful for your word. It has everything we need. It's a toolbox to help us through this life, to navigate through the difficulties, the trials and troubles. God, we are so weak, all of us, Lord. We're so prone to fail. God, I wish that I could go back through our marriage and change some things, but I can't. But Lord, I've been able from time to time to reassess my life and my attitude and my actions and try to fix it. Lord, we're not talking about the wife and her faults tonight. We're talking about us, the men. That we need to love our wives as Christ loved the church. God, I pray you'd prick the hearts of godly men tonight. That we'd be willing to get our lives right with you first. And when we do that, then we'll be able to lead our families. We'll be able to love as Christ loves. I pray you'd bless the invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. As the piano plays, heads back.